Hello, everybody, and welcome to Philosophy of Voluntarism, Episode 4. This is the... Um, oh, actually, the Philosophy of Voluntarism is covered by the Bibcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bibcot.org. So this episode is Nonviolent Communication, How to Build Bridges with me, Daniil Quayer from PeacefulAnarchism.com, Jim from jimlimberdavis.com and you can find more information about the philosophy of volunteerism at his website jimlimberdavis.com slash pov philosophy of volunteerism so today we have a guest chris chu who's coming in from arkansas he uh you can find him on facebook um under chris chu c-h-e-w and um, his his email where you can contact him uh for more information about nonviolent communication is love is anarchy dot uh, lovers anarchy at gmail dot com. So um, if you want to get in touch with him for whatever reason, that's his contact. And so we're going to talk about nonviolent communication, why it's important, why everybody can benefit, not just volunteers and anarchists, and and especially why it is vital for volunteers and anarchists to understand these concepts and stop hitting yourself against the brick wall. Uh, <laughs> trying to talk to people by uh, smacking them in the face. So <laughs> intellectually, of course. <laughs> um, so, uh, so Chris, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. You bet. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. So, um, so please start off with how you uh, came to volunteerism. A quick overview: of volunteerism and anarchy, and then from there we'll dive into nonviolent communication. Uh, absolutely. Well, I come from a very right-wing Christian Republican background. That was how I was raised. Um, I've lived in Arkansas for uh, 20 years now, so right in the heart of the Bible Belt. And and I was a Christian re Republican for a good, I think I was a Christian Republican graduating out of college. And I like to refer to kind of the thing that first introduced or nudged you in the direction of volunteerism as a, a liberty seed. That's what I call it. Mm. And my liberty seed, interestingly enough, is my front. One of my neighbors in college came out to me as gay, and at the time, given my background, I, I was taught as a child that homosexuality is is wrong, that I should not advocate it, and that I should not do anything to uh, permit such a lifestyle. I mean, this is legitimate. This is where I came from. So it's it's kind of interesting that. You know you have a good friend when they come out to you as gay, and your response is as divisive as mine was. Hmm. And, and it wasn't as divisive as it could be, but I told him I don't approve of this. Hmm. Um, I don't think that's okay. I'd rather not talk about it. It's essentially how it went. Hmm. But eventually we graduated from college, and I had kept in touch with him you know, back and forth. And, and he would call me on occasion. And, and I remember it was, a, it was a theme on our conversations for several weeks he would call me and you know the first time he called me he said he said chris if you ever went into the voting booth and you know i'm, I'm a, certainly a statist i thought voting was one of the most important things you could do he said if you ever went into the voting booth would you what what would you do if there it was on the ballot that they would allow um, gay couples to get married and and my first response was i would vote no hmm. that you know it, this was this was an obvious thing to me this is this is that's the canvas that was painted for me at that point in my life. And, you know, he was very patient with me, uh, very patient with me. We had more conversations about this. He, and essentially, he was able to convey to me that what, what hom the homosexual lifestyle, when two individuals who are of the same sex want to get married and do get married, this is not harming anyone else. They're, they're not infringing upon my rights. They're not, uh, you know, hurting me. And the thing that really stuck out to me, I remember I was driving to work and he had called me and he told me all he wants is to be happy and he wants to find the love of his life and get married. And I heard him say that and I and I just suddenly it was this feeling of shame. I, I thought, wow, you know, what am I doing here? Why am I sitting here and trying to to use the voting booth to tell people what they can and can't do, um, you know, if they're not harming me? And so 
yes, I was I was still a, a voting Republican and a Christian, you know, a good year and a half after that. But that planted that seed in my mind. It, it, it let me realize, well, maybe it's not OK just to pull that lever or push that button on, in the voting booth to to, uh, you know, try to control what other people can do, because maybe there is something beyond that. I can't change right from wrong just by doing that. So anyway, I guess I realized the, the harm that I was doing to others and, and the, the interference in people's ability to be happy, to have a pleasant, a, a more pleasant life in that lifestyle. So that eventually grew. I, I saw, I don't know how it came across, but Larkin Rose's video in he was wearing a goofy sweater. I'm allowed to rob you. And I had seen that too. <laughs> right. He, he and, and Adam Kokesh as well, I guess, and my, from my particular angle, the, the door I entered from with that right wing, I was very patriotic and pro-military, seeing the Adam Kokesh stand up for, for what he believed in, having that, that uh, background in, um, you know, in the Marines. And he had been to war. For, for whatever reason, that built rapport to me. I, that, that was something that was like, wow, I'm going to listen to this guy. But he was saying things I hadn't heard soldiers say before or, or ex-soldiers, you know, veterans. And, and to see Larkin Rose then from – so that was the patriotism side started to kind of fade away. You know, that was kind of the first, you know, drop of acid that would eventually dissolve that in me. But then Larkin started to talk about the, the, the Constitution, which to me was the Bible. Essentially, it was another Bible. It was, it was what is right and wrong to me. And suddenly with that I'm allowed to rob you video, I was like, huh, wait a minute. <laughs> You're not allowed to rob me. And he made a good point. And so anyway, it, it snowballed from there. And, and it eventually I came to realize what the what the philosophy of voluntarism was. And, and I didn't know what it was called at the time. But uh, that was kind of how I got into anarchy and in particular voluntarism. Beautiful. Yeah. Larkin Rose was a major... He was a big influence in me, Stefan Molyneux, also in the beginning. Now, now of course, he's a lot different now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, reading uh, yeah, Larkin Rose's book and you know, various other books, um, yeah, I really got into it as well. Uh, but that fa that's fascinating that, uh, about the, um, the homosexual you know, story that you had. And, and, it, and it's, it's, it seems like such a self-evident realization, you know, like two people love each other. They want to live live with each other. What's wrong with that? You're not hurting me. <laughs> and so much of what statism is about, it, 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 that's what's wrong with it. You're not hurting me by doing what you're doing. <laughs> you know, two people get together to have a transaction. It's not taxed. How is that hurting me? <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it, it's, I, I'm real big. I, I like to use the, the, the brush strokes reference is, when you're being raised and you're being grown up, you're told what is real and what is not real, what is right, what is not right, at least for me, probably not for everyone. But for me, I was told what to think and not how to think. Absolutely. I had to figure out how to think. And that was some of some of this, you know, contradictory things that I was hearing to what I was told what to think. And suddenly these people are breaking that down. I'm like, oh, but you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I think that's interesting that uh, both of you have gotten into and have repeated this phrase in one way or the another already seems almost half a dozen times right and wrong right and wrong right and wrong that is something that's a very very interesting here because that's an entire culture of the way everybody seems to interact every religion every government organization every hierarchy of authority where somebody is responsible for Dictating what people are going to do, when they are going to do it, how they are going to do it, and simply give the answer of because I said so or because this is the way things are done, but never actually offer a set of reasons why this has to be done other than just because I said so. They never actually give any meat or to what it is that they're trying to explain. And this culture of teaching everybody what's right and what's wrong is very combative in nature it's right to do this but why why is it right to do this it's wrong to do this okay why is it wrong to do that and when we get into this right versus wrong issue here that means that somebody's going to come out on top and that somebody has to come out on the bottom and that somebody has to be punished wrong implies that somebody has to be punished so where does this come from? 
Well, nonviolent communication actually discusses this very well. And where this comes from is that five, 10,000 years ago or so, when humanity was dependent upon small little groups, if somebody made a mistake that got the group hurt or didn't get them what they needed in order to survive as well as they could otherwise have, that individual made a choice that hurt everyone else. He was condemned and punished. So right and wrong came at least partially out of, out of our own history. And then when religion started popping up, it was right from wrong because people – they didn't have the time to discuss or to think about these ideas and refine them well enough to offer clear paths of thought progression behind them. And a lot of people got into this, well, this is right, this is wrong because of these reasons here and because so-and-so said so. And it became a chain of command. It became, it became red tape almost. Uh, nobody took responsibility for anything because the next person in the chain of command said so. Oh, well, that's God's will for us to die. That's what had planned. So the priest would pass it off to the next guy, and that guy would pass it off to the next guy. And finally, until it got to the top, and then it was, the, it was God's will. Or in the case of government, well, that's what the Constitution says. Or the men in, in robes and on the Supreme Court, that's what they said. You have to do what they say. And so everybody has to be seen as right or wrong. And there's this clamoring to get on top so that people can not be wrong. And it's always a, you don't have to run the fastest. You just have to run fast enough to avoid being in the latter bits of the race so you don't get collected as being wrong. And that's something that is that's very interesting that uh, has been mentioned already several times by both of you guys. And when we break that down, we understand that right from wrong ends up being combative. All sorts of, 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 of hostilities in the way we talk to one another, and it ends up be ultimately becoming the difference between understanding how to make an observation and how to pass judgment or in an evaluation. So nonviolent communication is going to be something that we want to – pay attention to the words we actually use when discussing things with other people. We don't want to judge other people because judgment of other people implies that we understand everything that they did and that we are condemning them for one reason or another. And it's very difficult to get into this. It's something that is going to re require practice and dedication and full comprehension of the subject matter that you wish to communicate. So in terms of talking about morality we really need to understand why we're invoking morality so that we can break it down in order to explain it to others everybody wants the same thing everybody wants peace and security and happiness and shelter and sustenance they want all of these things the key is to understand how they're getting those things and how we can help them get those things without hindering our abilities. And nonviolent communication is going to be one of the greatest things that we can do for that because it's going to help us to recognize the difference between recognizing what people want and need versus doing that through observations versus doing passing judgment on them because they're doing something that meets their needs, but it also hinders our ability to meet our need. That will get rid of the right versus wrong that gets rid of the punishment that's issued upon individuals for doing something that's not necessarily wrong. It's just – it just inhibits other individuals' abilities to provide for themselves, such as taxation, which was our previous episode. If people yeah, tax yeah. us for doing this, they're preventing our ability to go out and spend the money that we earn to buy more food, to buy a bigger house or more or a house or to buy entertainment, or to build a fence to protect ourselves from whatever. So that's just something I, I figured I'd throw that in there, there because you guys had mentioned it a couple of times there already. Well, and Jim, to, to kind of complement that and, and frame it in, in yet another way, when you were talking about right from wrong, I think what Danil and I were referring to 
uh, at least to some extent, I know I was, um, is a subjective right from wrong. This is what I was talking about was before I had ever considered, you know, whether or not my current conception of right for wrong was subjective or if there could be such a thing as an objective uh, truth. Right. And so. Absolutely. And I can't remember who it was who said this. I want to say it was Mark Passio had had said a statement, something along the lines of the truth is belligerent. Hmm. Referring to objective truth. And there's so many people who have their subjective in some respects, subjective and others, perhaps objective. But whenever you have a conception of truth that is or sorry, a perception of truth that is not in line with reality. That truth, the objective truth is belligerent. And so with an acknowledgement that objective truth is belligerent, nonviolent communication helps to ease that discomfort with others when you're discussing these things. Because I guarantee you that belligerence is not on your side when you're talking to them. This works against you. So nonviolent communication helps to kind of break down some of those barriers, some of those burned bridges that can occur. Um, I think some people will refer to it as cognitive dissonance when people hear things that con conflict with their current understanding of right from wrong. Nonviolent communication helps you to kind of read between the lines when you're talking with them and to be able to communicate and connect with them without losing them the moment you say this thing that conflicts. Because you say that and they jump into the right from wrong. I'm right and you're wrong and that's their goal. Instead of let's connect and see what we can agree on and see what things we can consider that we can walk away from this conversation and, and digest. So that, that's that's kind of another way to, to frame how exactly what you just said about uh, nonviolent communication. Oh, absolutely. That, that's, a, that, that's great that you bring that up because the first thing that popped to mind was perspective. I, I think a lot of us have seen that image where there is a shape and there's three different lights being sh uh, shown on this shape here. And the shadows that are cast, one is a circle, one is a square, and one is a triangle. It's all about perspective. Nonviolent communication gets us to see uh, the, the perspective of other individuals by asking them what it is that, they're, that they want us to to know and to be able to communicate that without immediately jumping to the conclusion that even though they're looking at the same things, they're just looking at it from different angles. And that's what that's one of those things that helps. And I think that the belligerence of the truth ends up becoming a inability of the individuals, uh, their nations. They're, they don't know how to communicate in such a way that says, hey, listen, I understand that this is what I'm seeing. We're looking at the same thing, but maybe we're looking at it from two different points of view. And the nonviolent communication disarms all of the combative language between the two, removes people from having to feel like if they're wrong, they're somehow going to be punished, and then allows people to exchange information that way. And that's, that's, that's great. I absolutely agree with that. So, um, Chris, before you get into any further, can you just introduce to those people – that are listening who may not have heard of nonviolent communication before, how you got into it and what it is, you know, simple definition. Are there, is it, you know, what the method is, you know, if there is a method, <laughs> because yeah, I'm not really that familiar with it. I, I just um, interviewed a couple people that know more about it. Sure, sure. Um, so I guess how I got into nonviolent communication, there was a, a point early in my transition to anarchy where the way I communicated with the world was to take some of these belligerent truths and to make absolutely certain that they were as belligerent as possible. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. I, I, I remember posting a picture of the Grim Reaper, and he's holding his, his uh, scythe, and he says, I support everyone's troops. And then, and then I would post something above that. This is this is extremely belligerent. This is going to trigger people, and that was my goal was to trigger people because I saw that this was getting interaction, but I didn't recognize that this interaction wasn't doing me favors, and, and in fact, it may have been burning bridges. So, and my family, I, I had some family disown me, and my mother had asked me every time I talked to her, please stop with the anarchy thing. Please don't talk about the police. Please don't talk about the military, mm. you know. And then she would talk to me whenever, whenever we'd have family functions as if I'm mentally ill. Hmm. 
And you know what? It, it's no surprise because oh, this is the approach I took. Okay. Um, and so I, I, at some point I realized I need to find another way of going about this. Surely there's another way. And you would think that I would have known that there was obviously, but to me, really, that was the only way I knew. I can't recall where I had come across it, but Jim had mentioned Marshall Rosenberg and, and I had been referred to this seminar and, and I watched a nine hour seminar by him and it completely blew me away. I, when I saw this, I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is the exact opposite of how I've been communicating, but it just clicked with me. It just made sense. And so now we, we've talked enough about, about my mouth communication. And I, and I think it's about time maybe to define kind of what that means to me so that people know what I'm talking about. So there, there's a couple of ways that I look at nonviolent communication as well as the method. I'll get to that after this. But the, the first way that I kind of how I would define nonviolent communication is really just the integration of empathy into the way that we communicate with others. And when I say empathy, what I'm referring to, I've, I've thought about this. It's kind of hard to describe what it is, but I, I truly do think the best way to describe empathy is to have the recognition of the relationship between our feelings and our needs. And I know that sounds bizarre. If someone's new to NBC, I know that sounds bizarre, but just work with it for a little while. Think about that, empathize. You try to empathize with others. And so anyway, so it's the it's a recognition of the relationship between our, need, between our feelings and our needs. And what happens when you recognize that? And when you actively attempt to take what that relationship is, which I will get to what it is, when you take that knowledge of what that relationship is and you try to apply that to the way you're communicating with others, what that leads to is compassion or essentially having a concern and acknowledgement of what the needs of the person you're speaking with are. Okay, so they may be coming from a completely opposite background. In fact, my first non-mount communication discussion was with an old friend of mine. I, I, we decided to meet up for coffee after not having spoken with ten, spoken with each other for ten years. And what I what I decided, I, I had spoken with him briefly, and he told me he was a libertarian socialist, and I was a uh, anarcho capitalist. I'm actually a, I'm actually starting to kind of avoid using the word capitalist, and we can talk about that another time. Um, but you know, I was a voluntarist, and I definitely uh, identified with anarcho um, capitalism at the time. And so I thought, huh. I don't see this conversation going anywhere, going in a positive direction. So I decided I'm going to try it out. This is the first time I tried non communication. It went brilliantly. We, we sat down outside at Starbucks and talked for four hours. <laughs> and his background, not only was he a libertarian socialist, but he had been in the police force and he mm. had been in the Marines. He trained, he trained Marines on the rifle range. And so he had this background that was, I can guarantee you, is the, the perfect recipe for a disaster of a conversation. Hmm. But I'm so glad I tried it. I was nervous to try it because it's really awkward. Not about communication. For me, it, you do wind up putting yourself in a vulnerable situation because we're trained not we're trained to ignore our feelings. And in fact, we're trained in, in a sense. And I say trained, I mean, it's kind of the things that we're told in, in culture today, at least in, in the United States or in, for me in particular, that – you, you know, feelings, oh, you know, um, you should, you should, you should, either it's not manly to, to acknowledge your feelings or to, to, to express your feelings. I, I just rejected that. And so for me to do this, to sit down with this person who I, I knew in my childhood, hadn't spoken with him in 10 years, and to suddenly open up to him and to say things about myself that were very vulnerable, something I would never tell even family members. Hmm. I did that in this conversation. And we walked away and I asked him, you know, after we were done chatting, I said, I said, you know, what do you think about that conversation? He was even able to ask, to, to guess my stance, because I didn't tell him my stance. Mm. But he knew where I was coming from, it, which is really interesting. But he said it was it was excellent. It was it was awesome. And it, it's interesting that he now moved to the town I live in now. And it just it was a coincidence. I didn't realize. So hopefully we can I can rekindle that uh, that relationship. Anyway, so back to what is not about communication. Um, so if... <laughs> So you acknowledge the relationship between needs and feel, feelings and needs. So, so what is that? So, so what is that relationship? Um, so essentially, with nonviolent communication, uh, it, the, that's the big revelation. 
what your feelings are is your feelings are a window into your needs. And in particular, and in, the, in particular, it's a window into your needs in the present moment. So it's what is alive in you in this moment. Taking the words out of the picture. What is alive in you? Are you angry right now? Are you sad? Do you feel lonely or disconnected from the world? Or alternatively, are you excited? You know, are, are, are you thrilled? Are you, um, you know, a, a, a deep sense of eagerness or uh, happiness, joy? So I, I just kind of described two different kind of sides of unpleasant feelings and pleasant feelings. And so what these feelings are indicating are a need that's either being that met or not being met in that very moment. And, and I, I, can't, I can't express how incredible this acknowledgement or this realization has been for me in my life because you know i thought it was a relatively minor thing but in reality this enables you to be able to listen to what people are saying and and in my opinion even more importantly to re reflect and to listen to myself and to get to know myself because suddenly i say huh i was i just said for example this is a recent conversation that i had i just said this person's thick-headed and i stopped and i thought huh that's not like me and, and I thought, well, where did that come from? And I thought about it. And I thought, well, what am I feeling right now? And, and I thought, well, I'm feeling angry and I'm feeling very frustrated. Why am I feeling angry and frustrated? And, and so essentially this allowed me to, and the next step was the need. I'm not going to get into that example right now. But, you know, I realized that I had needs that weren't being met in that moment while I was conversation, conversing with someone. And this was incredibly helpful. And in fact, I'll have to find a link to this conversation. This was a Facebook conversation, which are really a difficult one to do NBC with. Mm. But I wish I could link it because it was beautiful. You see, you see, you know, it's like someone pissing into a uh, an endless pit, and then you know, like that was about the equivalent of how this conversation was going. And then suddenly, boom! I realized what I said, and I said, "You know what? You're not thick-headed. I just want to let you know." The things I just said were coming out of a place of anger and frustration hmm. because I had these needs that I realized weren't being met. These were This was my intention. And so what I did here was I went from communi communicating in a very unpleasant way to suddenly trying in BC, not, not about communication, and I, and I said – and I basically got I, – I stopped beating around the bush and I said, you know what? This is what I'm trying to get out of this conversation. It turned out all I was wanting to do was to help bring clarity to them on a particular concept. And to help them. And I was giving my time in that moment. I could have been doing anything else in my, in my life at that time. I could have been doing anything. But no, I was giving them this attention. And, and I wasn't giving, making the time to connect with them. Anyway, so this has been incredible for me to make this realization of what our feelings represent. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I have talked to a lot of people who practice nonviolent communication. And the way they describe it is to me is quite similar to the way I talk to people in you know in real life and on online on Facebook in the sense that yeah like you said like like I try to figure out where the person is coming from you know cuz you know you we tend to gather everyone into this one big blob called status <laughs> uh, but that's a little bit uh, disingenuous because they're all coming at it from a different perspective and so I set my goal as figuring out what their perspective is, you know, what their particular, uh, I guess, needs are, you know, why they feel they need the state, you know, why they feel it's necessary. And then you talk about that and, and kind of disentangle that. And, and so basically I'm ask I'm just asking questions like, you know, kind of like Socratic questioning, you know, I just, I'm just passively asking questions and just trying to help them dissect their own thought processes oftentimes eventually you know contradictions arise and you, you know you begin to expose certain uh, inconsistencies but I, I tend to do it in a way that doesn't anger people it just it gets them to to realize like huh i didn't even, i didn't think you know a lot something that i get a lot when i talk to people is i never thought about that <laughs> which i really <laughs> love that phrase because it's like there's a part in their brain and talking to people, you know, we, we tend to think of them, like you said, thick headed or just stupid or, you know, whatever, but they're not. Some, some people just haven't thought of this stuff, you know? So it's like a part of their brain 
it's like it just has the lights off. <laughs> and so all we're doing is turning on the light. And they're like, huh, I never even considered that. And it's not necessarily about aggression and hostility that they cling to the state, but it may be just they're not aware of different ways of thinking, of viewing the world, of, uh, of perspectives. And so I think, you know, that's how I see my, my role. And, uh, you know, describing, you know, what basic morality is and, you know, understanding what basic property rights and self-ownership and just, you know, so, so it's more to me about education, you know, rather than, you know, of course, name calling, you know, that's, it's just, it's just so destructive when people start doing that. And, and of course, people, their, their emotional barriers go up and they just shut down and then cling fat, you know, steadfast to their beliefs. And that's it. <laughs> the conversation's done. So, so yeah, I don't know if that's considered nonviolent communication, but that's kind of been my, my, my approach. And it goes pretty well. Like, you know, you know, a lot of anarchists I, I've heard online, they say, you know, that, you know, like if you haven't gotten, you know, so many death threats then you're not a real anarchist, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But that hasn't happened to me. And I'm thinking to myself, one, one part of me is like, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And, and you, you yeah. know, when you get those death threats, that's a bridge burned right there. I mean, or potentially, you know, you got to right. rebuild that bridge somehow. You know, you don't want to dig yourself any deeper. But um, yeah, kind of kind of what you're getting at. Marshall Rosenberg, again, I, I'll bring his name up because I think he's a fantastic source for any newcomers to nonviolent communication. But he, he describes kind of what you're getting at. Uh, he describes it in this way and this is not an exact quote, but he says, everything that anyone ever says is a, is a form of saying please or thank you. And by that, you say please. If you have a need that is not being met, you say please. And so, Danilo, like you had just said, you were essentially alluding to when you listen to people, you're trying to listen for what is the need in that person that they're trying to meet. So, so if they're coming from a place of what it seems like hostility, and it's it's sometimes hard to to, to read in, in written text. So, um, this is particularly helpful in you know face to face. Mm. But if they're coming from a place of what appears to be hostility, then you would interpret that as they're asking please, which is a lot easier for you to hear, for you to be able to control yourself, for you not to let your emotions govern you, but for you to govern yourself in that moment. If you hear what they're saying as a form of please, but you don't quite understand that please, what, what are they asking me to help them with right now? That's helpful. Or if they're saying thank you, that's another way, which is excellent. That means the conversation has been very pleasant for both individuals and the person's saying thank you. You've helped me meet a need, my need for clarity or my need for connection right now. That's awesome too. But yeah, I, absolutely. And, that, and that's that's really what it's all about is as the the title of this this particular episode is called it's it's building bridges instead of burning them which you can and it does work it really does <laughs> you finally said it and this is what i was waiting for to uh to bring up something else what needs need to be met and i i think it is it's always going to be something akin to the search for internal peace through understanding or acceptance or to simply have the respect of the value they have placed upon themselves recognized. And everybody is looking for that to different extents and different degrees and in different ways. And this can come from many different things such as vindication, appreciation, or just being listened to. And the interesting thing is here though is that nonviolent communication is going to be rejected a lot of the time because right now – as Danilo said, people will just burn bridges, and it's very difficult, or I should say it's more difficult, it's more labor-intense to, to, to have to repair a bridge burned sometimes than it is to simply go out and create a new bridge with someone else or to have to clean up the bridge that was burned and then recreate all from scratch. And this right here… Where you find the truth in this is that the farther an individual can reach to communicate with other individuals, the more choice they have in order to create new connections and just abandon the old ones that they made. And when people decide that they don't need to do that to create or repair or to maintain older connections or bridges, 
they just go ahead and leave them alone. But the moment that the, their ability to communicate so broadly or their reach of communication disappears, they're stuck with the same handful of people just like 150 years ago in an old Midwest town somewhere where you might have had 100 people. You had to be able to create those connections and build those bridges and maintain the bridges because if you have to live in a town with the same hundred people and there's not really anywhere else to go, you're going to have a bad time. So nonviolent communication, I think, does so many wonderful things. But as I said previously, it's one of those things that requires practice, dedication, and full comprehension of whatever it is that you're trying to communicate with because communication is difficult enough as it is. It's still a, it's still a challenge, and this is a an example that I like to share with a lot of people. So it's still a challenge to explain what the color red is to someone else who's already seen the color red or has an idea and understands what the color is. We, 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 we giggle at this now because it's like, oh, that's easy. It's this and this and this. But what about explaining the color, what the color red looks like to someone who has seen color before but by strange coincidence never actually seen the color red? What about, what about explaining that the color red looks like to a blind individual who's never seen color before? I mean it can be done, but we need to understand that subject material first. To, to put this into a little bit of perspective, if I ask you guys to visualize a red apple tree, a lot of people may resort back to the kindergarten-style art where you have this uh, cartoon-looking brown tree trunk and a and a bushy green top and red apples on it. Okay, that's something that's tangible to all the senses. We can touch it, we can taste it, we can see it, we can smell it, we can all sorts of stuff. But we have a tangible reference for it, so it's easy to explain that because it meets or it can be experienced by multiple senses. But a color cannot. A color is something that we can only experience with one sense, our vision. So nonviolent communication gets into explaining something, particularly things that we cannot connect with with any senses at all. Nonviolent communication helps us to get past the barriers and allows us to be able to explain concepts to one another, like what self-ownership is, what axiomatic means, what appreciation is. These are all concepts that have no tangible qualities to them whatsoever we can't touch them and taste them and 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 physically feel them or see them this is stuff that we have to be able to explain so chris pointed out previously about how we are trying to connect the emotional side of the needs that we want to be met the needs such as maybe we need vindication because we just want to be shown that hey look we actually did something that was positive and we did not do something that was negative. We just wanted to have appreciation shown to us or we just wanted to say, hey, look, I just wanted to let you know that I didn't mean to do that. Well, well and that's something that's a big deal and it's not easy to do sometimes. But Jim, pilot communication helps us. Yes. I think it's brilliant that you used the example of describing the color red because I hadn't realized this until you said it here. Because because when you said how you describe the color red, I started thinking about how I describe it, and and I guess it has been worked into my uh, methodology to go to nonviolent communication. And actually, if you think about it, if you use nonviolent communication to describe the color red to a colorblind person, or or to a blind person perhaps, um, if, if you try to describe let's say colorblind, for example, you would you could actually describe the colors using feelings. You could because this is a common language that all human beings have. If you can find a way to communicate to them how you feel, which a lot of times this is nonverbal, right? Even if you don't even speak the same language. But if you're trying to describe the color red, you could you could um, ouch, ouch, you know, this hurts. This is this is painful. It's, it's hot. Right. So that may not be the best way, but if you look at the word kind of caution, oh no, fear or hot, or this may not be the best way to communicate it, but everyone can share this common knowledge of feelings, you know, or blue, ooh, cold or um, calm or, you know, 
uh, things of that nature. And I'm not an expert on color. My wife is actually an interior designer, so she could probably do a better job putting these uh, feelings to the colors than I can. But but um, but the, the colors, you know, they choose specific colors in hospitals for a reason because there's certain feelings in, that that these colors evoke they can they can help calm and soothe someone and and these are things that anyone can actually relate to and again it you can build bridges with people who don't even if you if your only language you speak is english you could even build a bridge by con- connecting via emotions i'm not sure how far you could go with that but certainly they could connect with you they could see someone crying on the street you know you could see someone just just in tears on the street you may not speak the same language as them but you sit next to them you know what it's like you've been there and That's you know it puts you you know what I mean? So, so it's interesting just that you use the example of color because that was the first thing I thought. I was like, nonviolent communication. That's like the best way to describe colors. <laughs> but hmm. that's is is that uh, nonviolent communication is not limited to actual language, v- verbal language. It's it's all sorts of language. It can be how you present yourself to another person. Are your arms folded and crossed? Are your hands in your pocket? Are your hands with your palms up and extended fingers out with is separated? Towards an individual, or are they clenching the fist, white knuckles down by your sides? I mean, nonviolent com- communication it encompasses everything that we do. When somebody says something that we disagree with or that we're bored of, do we do we yawn or do we make an abrupt clearing our throat sound or do we roll our eyes? I mean, it's, it's it encompasses everything, and nonviolent communication is one of those things that, with practice and dedication. One can actually pay attention to how they interact more with other individuals through everything that they do. It actually is something that since I have been listening to this and studying this, I have paid more attention to how I physically present myself to other individuals, and it has helped tremendously. It, it's, it's just something that I cannot praise enough, and I also cannot thank you enough, Chris, for introducing this to me. As something that I was already building towards, but had no idea that this was where I was going. So, it's a wonderful thing there. And we just need to probably hold Danilo down and get him away from all of the things that he does with everybody else for just a few moments, and just play this video. Maybe put toothpicks on the corner of his eyes to hold it open and make him watch. It. No, that wouldn't be very voluntaristic. <laughs> yeah. Or Danilo, if you want to meet with me, we can talk about it. If you're curious, we can we can talk more in depth. If you have specific questions or concerns or doubts, <laughs> or anybody for that matter, if you, I, I'll, I do check my my email, uh, loveisanarchy at gmail dot com. I'm always happy to to discuss this topic with others. So. Yeah, so I was thinking as you guys were talking about this, um, there's a woman on Facebook that uh, has been commenting a lot under my posts and my page, my Peace Foundation page, and on Jim's page, Liberty Defined, and she's um, pretty nasty. And she's been doing this for a while, just under every post, just like attacking, 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 right? Just nasty. And I don't usually respond to people like that. And I think, I think Jim, you're the same way, right? If somebody's yes. just being nasty for nasty's sake, like why are you gonna just why are you gonna respond? They're, they're not genuinely asking a question. They don't want to learn anything. They just want to be nasty and insult. So why respond? So I don't. And, and other people respond. But recently, uh, she commented. Um, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, under one of my posts, and she said, "I'm sorry for my comments, for how I'm so uh, derogatory and insulting to you." I realize how much you know patience you have and how you're genuinely trying to get this message across and I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> and I thought that was amazing that I didn't even I didn't even like try to fight with her. I just like didn't even <laughs> pay her any mind and she just I guess maybe she could sense through my videos how I am and that uh, that's not me who I am is 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 to respond to things like that. And and just that alone <laughs> seemed to change her. And since then, she has stopped with those comments. I don't know. Did you notice that, Jim? That she stopped? I, I did notice that. Yeah, she was commenting on my pages too. And it's a powerful thing. I mean, this is this is something that's very important to the philosophy of voluntarism: is freedom of association. Right. We don't have to punish people directly 
or even intend to punish them indirectly when they act in a manner that is off-putting or aggressive or or destructive or, or combative or all we have to do is just hey look I no thank you I and just not say anything mm. and of the people who genuinely want to make a connection or want something like in her case she wanted to be heard but because we did not respond and so many other people asked simple questions of her it ended up being she wouldn't answer those questions but just wanted to talk and eventually she came back and she apologized for it and then she still interacts occasionally that I can see and she wants she is asking other questions and being more positive and getting more making more connections with other individuals she's getting she's getting the things that she wants out of it or more of them and it's she's obviously getting some something out of it that she wants one of her needs is being met and a need that every human being has except for me because I sit in my apartment all day long and do nothing unless I have to go to work to earn the tax dollars to pay Uncle Sam so they don't shoot me. Um, but uh, no, I, I don't really do that. But uh, you know, everybody wants those connections. Everybody does. And that's an important thing. So when we are paying attention to what we're doing, we can help meet other people's needs by simply saying, listen, if you want to connect with us, this is how I would prefer to be communicated with. This is how I would prefer to be interacted with. You want the connection with me, but I do not desire a connection with you. Mm. So if you want to pursue a connection with me, this is how I would like that connection to happen. And that's a very, very powerful thing in order to, to do because a lot of people immediately no, this is just rejection because you don't like me. No, this is not rejection because I don't like you. This is this is a declining to take that offer of connection because it does not meet my needs of security and comfort because as I have been severely disciplined as a child by my father, people who raise their voice, people who make demands and or demands of obedience and compliance immediately or else – that triggers something in me where I was conditioned to expect to be hit mm. by my father. And I don't want that. So a lot of people are like that to various extents. They want that need met of comfort and security. So when somebody is aggressive and hostile and condescending, that puts them at a position where they need something met first in order for that connection to be made. And, so, yeah, she eventually got to that point there, and things it looked like have changed for her, and it's been fantastic. It's been, it's been beautiful, actually, and I'm, I'm glad that we've at least had the impact on one individual, which is fantastic. Well, you know, Jim, it's, it, I like that you had mentioned that nonviolent communication is essential to voluntarism because actually the way that I see nonviolent communication is that – it is voluntarism in practice, mm. or, or to be to put it mm. another way, voluntarism is to physical human interaction, what nonviolent communication is to human communication. Wow, I and just if, got replaced as a host on the show. Good job, Chris. <laughs> 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 Excellent. But like the, so, so I guess what I'm trying to get at here is, I mean, it seems like a lot of people go this logic route, and and they and they they know from success in their own interactions with others, that voluntarism works. Um, but when people talk about nonviolent communication and how successful it is, it's also a testament to voluntarism. And let me tell you why I say that. So, like I said, voluntarism, it's the belief that all human interactions should be consensual and voluntary. Or a little redundant there. Well, you can actually apply that philosophy to the way you communicate with others. I haven't quite figured out how to word this. I, I've tried to actually type this out and, and communicate it. I haven't figured that out. I'll give it. I'll give it a shot right now. So, if you define violence as having any interaction with another individual without their consent, such as rape, assault, theft, murder, things of that nature. The, the wrong element in that is the lack of consent. So 
if you if you think about the way you communicate with others, how is it that you could apply this concept? Well, when so, when someone says something, you have to be very careful about how you portray what they just said. For example, <clears throat> or, or what they just did. For example, let's say I was a child. I, I'm, I'm one of four children, and we used to fight over who would get to eat the good cereal, the real sugary cereal. And someone would always come down, and they would eat two, bil- two bowls of the sh- you know, cinnamon toast crunch or whatever, and people would be so angry. And, and I can remember as a child, I would say, I would say, well, you ate that because you're selfish and you don't care about any of us. That's what I said. Now, this is, this is what have I just done here? I've just painted this person as a selfish person who doesn't care about his brothers and sister. Is that true? Are they selfish? Do they really not care? I never gave them the choice. I never allowed them to consent to that image of what they were doing. And, and it's kind of hard to say. I'm, I'm not saying that you can't say something about somebody without their consent. In this, there might be a truth that you can say that they don't want to admit, for example. But what I'm getting at here is with not about communication, and this is another part that we haven't covered yet. This is key, is it's all about trying to seek clarity an understanding of what they're saying. You want to accurately understand what it is that they just said. And I'll get into the method in a second, or I'll I'll get into it right now. People who are brand new to nonviolent communication, you're probably going to learn something about a method. It's, uh, there's a four letters to it, O-F-N-R, observation, feeling, need, request. That's the sequence that you go when you are going to use nonviolent communication interacting with others. And so, when, when you're talking with someone, you're trying to portray, portray them as says, you have to make the observation accurate. So, so the way you might say something to someone who, um, I'm going to get rid of the, the bowl of cereal example because that's kind of hard to use. But the way you would say something to someone, you, you say, you, did you, you, usually the observation is obvious. You say what they did. But then there's the feeling. You might say, you know, I noticed that you, you did this thing, um, you know did you do it because you have a need? Now I'm skipping feelings here, but you might, you might, you might try to guess the need that they're trying to meet in that moment. You say, I noticed that you ate all, well, I'll go back to the cereal example. You ate all the cinnamon toast crunch, you know, and I know what it's like to get to eat two bowls of cinnamon toast crunch. That's awesome. I love it. It was so good. (laughs) So I know that joy. And so I know that there's a, there's a need that's being met there. And so I might say something like, I noticed that you ate all the cinnamon toast crunch. And I'm angry, of course. I'm angry, right? But I, but let's focus on them for a moment. Because you know what it's like. to You know why you would eat two bowls. So you'd say, you know, were you doing that because you really love that cereal? You know, is that one of your favorite cereals? And, and maybe, you know, are you doing that because you know that you know what it's like for that cereal to be gone and, and, and to not have the option to have that second bowl, for example? You know, something like that. But again, you, what you're doing, you're asking for clarity. You're saying, look, I'm saying this, but I want you to know that I respect you enough to let you clarify for me because I don't want to make assumptions about you. I don't want I don't want to diagnose what you just did. I don't want to um, I don't want to, to 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 make it seem like your intentions are something that they weren't. You know, so again, you're, you're making a connection here and, and it goes a really long way. It really does, um, you know, because people see um, I know on this show, y'all have y'all have said um you referred to one of the benefits of, of using uh, nonviolence is, is uh, your, I think the words you are, use are, you're, you recognize the value that other people place on themselves. Mm-hmm. And in communication, it's a similar thing. When you're communicating with people, you want to seek clarity because you recognize the value in, in what they did. They could have, again, they could have been doing anything in that moment, but this is what they chose to be doing. And you know that you value your time and you value what you're doing and you value yourself. And so for you to acknowledge, it's more just saying, look, you know, I know you're another human being just like me. And, you know, I just want to have an accurate understanding of where you came, came from there. Right. And so then, of course, you would move on to, to inward reflection of yourself. I felt angry in that moment. Right. So I'd say, well, I, too, like that. And, and I'm and I'm really disappointed. A lot of times you don't have to even get to the request phase of nonviolent communication, because if you can make the, an accurate observation and you can connect with that feeling that they felt, the feeling that you felt, and then to identify the needs the, the reason you felt that way, usually the issue works itself out in the end. 
because the next time someone comes down there, it's like, huh, you know, this person clearly cares about, uh, well, you know, I guess it's a way of saying they care about me, right? This, this person before was able to connect with why I did that. Even though they were angry, they knew I did it because I, I felt joy out of it. You know, they connected with me there. So the next time they come down and get that bowl of cereal, they're probably going to ask you next time. As an example, they might ask you and say, hey, you know, um, there, there's only two bowls left again. And I know, you know, we, we talked about this before. I remember this. It, it meant a lot to me because you were angry, but you still gave me the time of day because you wanted to know where I was coming from there. And so, you know, maybe we could split it or maybe you could have the second, you could have the second bowl today. And then the next time we come into conflicts like this, I'll take it the next time, right? I mean, so, some sort of compromise, but it doesn't have to be, you know, explicitly determined right there in that moment to make a request. You can, and be specific if you do about what you want them to do. And certainly don't have any guilt behind that. Like, if you don't, then I'm gonna be angry sort of thing. Be genuine if you're going to actually make a request. But if you're going to put it on them that that somehow you're responsible for meeting their need, for example, like, um, you know, oh, well, my brother who ate that cereal, he's responsible for meeting my need for joy, too. No, no. If I'm going to make a request for something specific, like we'll both share a, a bowl of cereal or something, I need to make be genuine about it being a request because they'll sense if that's a demand. Again, if I make it a demand, it's it's a punishment. It's saying, "Well, I'm going to retaliate against you if if you don't do what I'm saying." It's not a request. That it's not a a peaceful thing in a sense. It's kind of hard to describe it because we're not talking about physical interaction, but it really does ap apply to the way you communicate. And so that's, that's how I see NVC. It's voluntarism in communication form, <laughs> and it has all the benefits of it. Just manifests itself and manifests itself differently. I think you just um, betrayed the fact that you were a child in the '80s with that uh, with that example. <laughs> am, am, am I right about that? I'm just guessing. Uh, I am, yeah, I'm 29. So yeah, yeah, I, I was born in uh, '87. So. Oh, well, okay. I thought. All right. All right. '90s then. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah more, more I was 90s. a '90s kid. All right. All right. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> He's young, you know. He's That's young. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can definitely empathize with that example <laughs> because my my sister would often have that uh, complaint about me <laughs> finishing. We, but in our case, it was the uh, the life cereal. I don't know if you guys ever had. Oh that. yeah. <laughs> oh, we. I have some of that in my cupboard right now. Still. <laughs> <laughs> my mother never bought me the, the sugary stuff. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, so, so yeah, we're approaching the hour right now and I know it doesn't feel like we talk for an hour. It's amazing conversation, <clears throat> but I wanted to just say that, uh, you know, Chris, thanks a lot for coming on. And I think, I think this warrants another conversation cause I feel like we just <laughs> scratched the surface of this, of this topic, which is really, uh, really it's going to be another <laughs> unintended consequences of taxation deal here. We're going to have to come back to this multiple times. Yeah, yeah, and that's fine because uh, this is a wonderful, a wonderful topic for for volunteers and anarchists to understand. Because, as you said, it's not just about logic. This is not a statism is not a philosophy that most people did not come to through logic, and so most of the time it's very difficult to have them understand why it is contradictory and inconsistent with logic alone, right? So we need to appeal to different needs. And so, yeah, most of the time, you know, they've just been taught by their parents, by their teachers, by, you know, other friends that this is just the way to be. And there's no logical reason for it. It's the appeal to antiquity. It's the appeal to popularity. Uh, everyone believes it. You know, it's just the way it is, right? <laughs> but like so many things that are believed for those reasons, they're most likely wrong. <laughs> if you have not, the, if you have not done the proper investigation and research yourself into understanding why, as Jim always harps on, why do you believe this stuff? You know, why do you, why do we invoke morality? Why do we need to understand economics? Why, why are all these things important? Uh, and if you take these things just on face value, you may be committing um, a big, uh, a big error on your part, an error of judgment. Thanks, as advocates of government do. Just do it because it's better. Well, if we don't understand why it's better and remove the it's just better because that is just subjective and opinion, we need to make that actual observation with 
some sort of examples and a clear path of thought progression as to what makes this better, better for what. And it's always going to be the same result, whether it's morality or liberty or nonviolent communication. It's always about the improvement of our, our ability to maintain and then improve the quality of our lives. That's what it always boils down to. So we need to look at that. We need to understand, see the common ground. Advocates of government want to well, – they want peace. Everybody likes to just – or a lot of advocates of, of liberty movements and things like that want to just lump them in and say, no, they just want control and power because they're, 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 they're bad people. They're not. They just – they want peace and security and comfort. They're just going about it in a way that is contradictory or a big hindrance for everyone else to do it like us. So we don't want that. We want to remove that, and I think nonviolent communication is going to go a long way in helping us build bridges between those who are hurting us but do not understand that they're hurting us and be able to bridge that gap there, allow us to actually exchange information so that they can willingly, in time, abandon that path of thought and start picking something else up, which allows them to not only see the value that they placed upon their lives, but to see the value that others have placed upon their lives and start showing respect for that in order to avoid the backlash of, oh, you expletive, expletive, expletive statist. Right, right. And I just want to finish up by saying that, yeah, empathy is a very large part of this. And, you know, the idea that if I want freedom to pursue my life, things that I'm interested in, without state hindrance or interference, I must advocate for the freedom of my neighbor to do the very same thing. Um, you, know, so, you know, of course, so, so as long as they're not infringing on another person's uh, self ownership or property rights, you know, we must that that freedom must be reciprocated, reciprocal, and that's the only way for it to be consistent. So we must always empathize with not only our neighbor, but people living an ocean away. You know, it doesn't matter what other beliefs they have. If they are not hurting anybody, if they're not infringing on other people's um, self-ownership or property rights, we must grant them that very same freedom. We must advocate for for their their freedom as well. Uh, I think that's completely necessary. So, so yeah, empathy, a paramount importance. So, um, so Chris, anything you'd like to leave uh leave our guests or our listeners with or and also uh just plug the ways that people can uh, find you if they want to contact you sure 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 well just as a heads up i wasn't expecting to only have made it through about a third of what i wanted to discuss so <laughs> so if, if y'all ever um get the desire to invite me back on i'd be happy to to keep on going where we left off but i guess to add just a little bit to this I had touched on how culture, our culture and, and sort of our conditioning has has uh, put it in people's minds that our feelings are things to be rejected, to be bottled up, to be ignored, that we must only take the logical truth for the logical route uh, to in the pursuit of truth. And we should take the logical route in the pursuit of truth. But you're missing out on so much if you don't realize what those feelings are. If you don't utilize them, because the knowledge of what those those feelings are just signals, and absolutely you should. I, I say I call myself. This is something I learned from Mark Passio. Definitely, a monar monarchist within and an anarchist without. You must be able to rule yourself within, and if you allow your emotions and your feelings to rule yourself, then you have anarchy within, and that's not a pleasant thing. You need to be able to to rule yourself. Self-governance is important. Mm. And you can't govern yourself if you put all your feelings aside. Well, you, you probably can, but to know what those – to have the tool of knowing what those feelings represent, to know that those are signals that point to needs being met or not being met is absolutely vital, in my opinion, to self-governance, to govern yourself within, to be able to process your thoughts, your feelings – and your needs in a pleasant and healthy way that can help build bridges with others. So anyway, uh, so like I said, I've only covered about a third of the notes I have <laughs> here. I was, I just kind of have some bullets on things I want to talk. It's like, wow, we've only made it to the intro part. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. I'm happy to join again. If anyone uh, is interested in discussing this with me, 
I'm more than open to. Again, my email is loveisanarchy at gmail.com. I'm, I'm very happy to, to chat with you. Please don't feel intimidated. I still consider myself a, a baby to this form of communication, even though I've been practicing it for two years in my own ways. Please don't be intimidated. If it makes you feel any better, we can sit down on a, on a conversation at some time, at some point, and I'll tell you all of my weaknesses and, and, and things I'm not good at if that helps you feel any better because <laughs> I love sharing this with people and you know, I, I, I want to break any barriers that are necessary to, to help communicate with others how important and, and helpful this tool can be. Beautiful. Jim, any, any final words before we close up? No, I, there's so much to say. There's so much to keep going with that. I just, only thing I can add is just that we have to be patient. Uh, we have to be patient with ourselves first. And until we can understand what it is that we're feeling and how to communicate that, we're not going to be able to truly empathize with other people. We have to be able to understand and organize ourselves inside. And the more organized we are on the inside, the more prevalent our ability, the more advanced, the more skilled our ability to communicate with others will become. We won't be able to connect with people until we have the anchors inside of ourselves to latch things onto and then to bring out and help others hold on to as well. So that's something that uh, we need to work on. We have to work on ourselves first before we can even consider making connections with others, let alone working on them. Excellent. Well said. So uh, I, I just finished up. Uh, I, I remembered a, a little anecdote that Donnie Giebert said about something like uh, related to this about logic and emotion. And he was saying that in, in every person's mind, there is a man on an elephant, right? And the elephant re re symbolizes the, um, you know, the emotional reactive uh, limbic system type part of the brain. And the, the man symbolizes the logic, the rational, the reason part of the brain. And so you can talk to the man all you want <laughs> and have him understand all the concepts and you want him to go left and he wants to go left, but then the elephant goes right and you have no, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> so it's so important to me. That just highlights how, how important it is to relate to somebody, to connect with somebody on an emotional level, to calm down, assuage their fears, to let them know that we're not a threat. You know, we're not attacking their ideology. We're just educating them a little bit. You know, we're showing them a different way to see things. You know, it's not about attacking and insults and, and putting put downs and being derogatory. No, it's not about that at all. It's, you know, it's primarily about education. And I think if uh, people can focus on that, they can make a lot more headway, uh, a lot more success. So, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, wonderful conversation. So, uh, if anybody wants to help us out, you can do so. We're going to have our Patreon. We, we didn't set it up yet, but we will very soon. <laughs> so um, for now, you can uh, donate patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism or uh, Jim, Jim, I think it's jimlimberdavis.com slash donate. Is, it, is that yours? Yeah, it's, you can just find jimlimberdavis.com and, and I will have links all over the place. It'll be there. Great. I will put a specific link just for us, uh, jimlimberdavis.com slash POV where it's just going to be for philosophy voluntarism and uh, anything else that you would like to find there. I'm still working on it. I have a lot of things, a lot of different projects to work on. But this is something that uh, I'm slowly adding more and more to every day. So that's where you can find more about uh, the philosophy voluntarism off of uh, Facebook. I mean, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please, uh, please support us. We don't, we don't do this because it's a lucrative uh, endeavor. We do this because we love to do it, and we Wait, we're passionate. What, we do? I mean, yes, we do. <laughs> we have a burning desire to spread knowledge and add to the the, the lore of human uh, information and knowledge and wisdom. And so, yeah, we're just making our Ooh, fingerprint. Add on your that. catchphrase. Add your catchphrase with the "We do our darndest." I love hearing that. We do our, <laughs> yeah, we do our darndest to make this world a better place. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you if you feel so kind as to if you, if you find value in what we do, just trade value for value and uh, and donate. You know, even a dollar goes a long way for us. So yeah, you know, we're we uh, w that's the democratic way of supporting, right? We don't we don't support democracy in terms of politicians and elections, but we support democracy in terms of 
currency and exchange, right? You know, you put your, you patronize and support the businesses that you want to see thrive and flourish. And if you find value in our work, please support us. So we can have more wonderful conversations with people like Chris here. So um, thanks a lot, gentlemen, for a wonderful conversation. So this is uh, Daniel Cuellar and Jim for the Philosophy of Volunteerism. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.